So if you're like me, you have definitely noticed that there has been a massive increase in the cost of housing over the last few years. What does this have to do with design and why am I talking about it? Because that has brought on this amazing trend around tiny homes. And today I want to dive into where this trend is coming from, how we're seeing it evolve, and even my own thoughts on tiny home design. So where I live, I have noticed that housing prices have risen exponentially. And this has happened in not just where I live in Ontario, but it's really happening everywhere in North America from what I see. And what's happening is a lot of different things, supply, demand, um, change in lifestyles. There's, there's a whole bunch of things happening. So what I'm really finding exciting is that here locally, we are seeing um, a real shift with our city officials in that they are now allowing these tiny home structures to be constructed on people's personal lots. Of course, there are parameters and restrictions around size. There's building codes that we have to meet and follow, height restrictions, etc. So it's not a free for all, but it is something that's really exciting because in the past, it really wasn't something that you could do, you know, within the urban city limits. It was definitely more something for people who had a little bit more land and a little bit more space. I think what's really exciting is that this tiny house movement that isn't new, is definitely seeing a shift and it's shifting for a multitude of reasons. Affordability is unfortunately just not there for people to get into the housing market. I want to talk about tiny house design and where I'm seeing it go and some of the interesting thoughts that go around to building a tiny home, whether you're thinking about building one, or you've seen one or you're just interested in them. But I feel like we often see a lot of tours around tiny homes, which is awesome and exciting. But one of the things that I like to talk about that people don't often think about is what you really have to think of when you're actually trying to design one. And I know this because we actually, my team and I, do sell and make tiny home plans on our Etsy website, as well as I have been hired to do several tiny homes in the local community. So it's really exciting time right now in the design world. And there are certain things you really gotta think about when it comes to a tiny home. And trust me, it took a lot of research to figure this stuff out. So a tiny home typically is a home that's under 500 square feet and it can go right down to like 100 square foot. Now, I usually tend to stay around that 500 square foot mark. Um, the last home we did, uh, designed was 534 square feet. Um, I have one that I guess is technically not like a tiny home, it's like 685 square feet, so it's a little bit over that true tiny house standard, but basically around that 500 square foot mark is where most tiny homes are. The biggest thing that you need to embrace when you're looking to design or build a tiny home is multifunctional use. And I know I feel like we hear that about a lot of things, but when you're designing a tiny home, it's way more important that you don't underutilize any space that you do have. So some of the areas that I try to utilize as best as I can is the kitchen slash bathroom slash anything to do with plumbing. So what I really like to try and do is try to utilize one wall as your plumbing wall. Why is this important? Because you don't wanna be running different lines all throughout the house and you wanna to try to limit how much of that you have to think about. And sometimes when it comes to tiny houses, people just think of um, the aesthetics of it, but you really actually do have to think of where something as simple as your plumbing for everything is located so that you can kind of build off of that. So I personally always start with, if there is like a mezzanine or a lower level, where does that need to fit in, in conjunction with the kitchen and the bathroom? Because those tend to be your struggle points when it comes to designing a tiny house. Most likely you won't have a huge bathroom, but you do have certain square footages that you really wanna keep in mind when you're doing a bathroom. You need certain clearances to access the toilet comfortably, to use the shower, have a sink, and all the proper movement. 
A really good trick that I do tend to use is a pocket door, or if you like the look of a barn door, but something that slides into a wall, saving that space of like a door swing is also something that's really, really helpful in a tiny house. You do tend to see that a lot, and I think sometimes people think it's an aesthetic thing, but it really does just save a lot of space. Another thing in Ontario specifically, and this is something that's not addressed very often at all when it comes to tiny home plans, is the stairs. So the Ontario Building Code is very strict on our stairs from its width, its uh, rise height, its tread depth, and we can't just kind of have like these climb all over furniture to get to say a mezzanine level. So if you are designing a tiny home in Probably Ontario is, I'm gonna say, one of the most strict, maybe even in California might be really strict because their building codes tend to be fairly strict as well. But basically, you really actually do need to check out your local building codes to see if there are any limitations with how a structure is put together. So in Ontario, I've often had to do what looks like very typical stairs and people think, why don't you just do what you see on TV all the time? Unfortunately, we can't do that here. It does have to be um, a certain width, which, you know, for safety, getting in and out in a fire, all that kind of stuff is, is brought into that. So when you're thinking about a tiny house design, the stairs are really important. However, stairs are a great multi-use space. So you can have the treads open up and have storage inside of them. You can have along the side of the stairs, like have some pull-out doors. Like you can really look at using that space that's underneath and almost awkward with the stairs as extra storage, whether it's for shoes, coats, um, items that you don't use. Like if you live in Canada, you're gonna have like winter stuff and summer stuff, you know? So like thinking about those type of things and where do they live when you're not using it? Because I find specifically in client climates like Ontario, we deal with a, a really wide variety of, you know, different temperatures, exposures, etc. So some of those items also need to be thought about, like where does it go? Other things that people tend to forget about is a washer and dryer, as well as the hot water tank, because most of the time people, especially when you're in an urban setting and you can tie into existing plumbing and water and all of that stuff, where does that go? So I personally really like to spec, it's a two-in-one washer dryer. It's really common in Europe. We don't tend to see as much of them here, but I think it's Miele makes a really good one, but there's a bunch of them that you can buy even on Home Depot. And then taking that measurement and starting with that and my fridge, because those two items tend to always kind of be like the big awkward bulky ones that you have to fit in if you're gonna go with a full-size fridge. I find most people do wanna have at least like, not a full-size, but like an apartment-size fridge in their space. So that's something that you, I always try to think about where do I put this in relation to the space? Because in a kitchen, there's a certain flow that you really want to work. And in a tiny house, it's not any different, it's just, a smaller footprint, but you still need to think about things like not just your major appliances. So if you have an oven, some people may or may not want an oven. Um, I try to usually do like a pretty small scale oven, like one of those wall ovens, and then just a two burner top. That seems to be like kind of the standard that I do for our tiny house designs. However, if somebody's a really big cook and they want more space than that, you have to account for that. But also storage, where do you put your pots and pans? Where do you put your cups and plates? I find that that's often forgotten about in the sense it's like we need certain things, but then they forget about how much counter space you need to work on, as well as somewhere to eat. So sitting on the couch might not be a problem for some people, but for some other people, they really wanna think about Maybe a space kind of integrated with the kitchen. If you can't have an island, maybe the counter pulls out somewhere and has like an extra eating surface. So thinking about how can I use the kitchen in a way that really captures everything that a full-size kitchen would have and how do I do that? Other things like appliances and all those things, like having creative ways of having them stored and actually thinking about them before you get into the design phase of a tiny house is super important to really create the best plan and best layout that you can come up with. So 
I always try to think of like, what are your go-tos? A microwave, a toaster, maybe like a, a toaster oven, um, maybe a blender. Some people like can't live without their blender. So I try to think of some of the key things that I might want in this space. And then you also need to really think about outlets. I know these are all things you're like, probably wouldn't have even thought about, but if you do have an appliance, like a bunch of appliances, making sure you have enough outlets, making sure you have enough storage, where do those things live? So that is how I start planning for a tiny house kitchen. Also, you need to think about when we're talking about the hot water tank, if you don't have a basement, you need to think about where that goes. And I typically have been putting them in the kitchen somewhere. I know it might sound weird. You could also maybe put it in the bathroom or even like underneath the stairs if you have kind of like an area. Now, I wouldn't normally use a hot water tank. I use a tankless water system, but it still has like a small tank that's on the wall. So trying to figure out where to put that what I like about the kitchen is that you can kind of hide it behind cabinetry, but it's still easy access, but it does eat up a lot of storage space. So then the next place that I might think about using it is potentially somewhere underneath the stairs. If you have stairs, if you don't have stairs, then we do need to think about where do we put that? Is it maybe next to or near the bathroom? Like you want to think about somewhere that you can maybe tie it in with some millwork, and generally in your open kind of floor area, there may not be a really great spot for that. So you really wanna to try to think about where does that tankless water heating system go if you go with that route. If you end up doing like a solar and you're like super off grid and you have like tanks outside that run, that's, that's we're not talking about that. I'm talking about like typical building in a town where somebody's severing, not severing, but like putting it on their lot as maybe a rental dwelling or for their children or whatever. So I'm trying to think of like a little bit more traditional building standards that I look at. You know, people don't love a compost toilet for the most part. Like some people want to live in a tiny home, but they don't want to be like off grid living. Do you know what I mean? So those are the things, you know, that I think about from that sense with like, it's very important because they take up space. Um, another thing, are, what's your heating source? Are we gonna do, you know, like uh, baseboard heating, which is just using electricity? Do we wanna use a wood burning? Wood burning comes with a whole bunch of restrictions too because you have to have um, certain like hearth space and it has to have a lot of clearance around it. So I find that sometimes in Ontario, getting a wood burning system in place is a little bit harder, but doing the electric or the gas is a lot easier and you could totally go with that route. But then you also wanna think about space and making sure that you're very mindful of the size of the unit in conjunction with the space. Because sometimes it actually could be much too large and produce much too much heat. And if you're using a gas heating source like a fireplace, it's harder to possibly control the temperature of the home. So I personally try to always work in a baseboard heating system because I do find that that's just a little bit easier to manage and to get a little bit more of consistent heat. Another really good option is geothermal heating, which is, I mean, very expensive, but totally doable, or, you know, some in-floor heating system, which then does the radiant heat, which is also great. So things add up. Another thing that people don't tend to think about with tiny houses is the cost. I feel like people assume quite often that tiny house, tiny price. And I will tell you, that is just not the case. Unfortunately, tiny homes per square foot are quite expensive because you're still taking all the things that you need in a much larger home and putting them in a small home. So you still have to pay to have the plumbing done, to have the electrical done, to have you know heating run, to have sewage figured out. Um, so it's all of the stuff that make the house actually function as a home <laughs> that you still need all of those things, whether it's in 500 square feet or you know 5,000 square feet. So the price isn't as low as most people would think on a tiny home. It actually per square foot can tend to be higher than a bigger house. So I'd say like your typical house, like 2,500 square feet, a tiny house to build is still like in comparison a lot cheaper obviously than buying one, but it's just not as cheap as people think. 
you know, you've probably got to put aside, I would say, around a hundred to hundred and twenty thousand dollars to do a nicely outfitted and fully functional roughly 500 square foot tiny house now this is just like a rough estimate like today this is where i'm finding that they're landing with the ones that we have been specking and pricing out so another thing that i want to address with a tiny house that you should really think about is furniture when it comes to the furniture, a lot of times I find when I've watched things on tiny houses is a lot of people will try to do built-in furniture or you know some weird, I don't know, piece that folds up and has storage. And although that's really good to have storage, it's not comfortable. <laughs> Sitting on a box that has cushions on it is not comfortable. So my kind of like rule of thumb is, is to find appropriately scaled furniture for the tiny house. And it can absolutely have storage in it. So I know, for example, especially if you're on a budget, Ikea does have couches that have like little things that pull up and have like storage inside of them. So I would prefer going for something like that, that's like a proper couch with storage in it, than trying to do something built in to fit a space because you can get a wide variety of scale and sizes. And if you really do plan your tiny home out very intentionally, you should have enough storage for all of the items that you do need to live in the space without needing to have that extra storage within the couch, to be honest. So I personally try to just scale the furniture appropriately. And to buy proper furniture definitely makes it feel more like a home. And I think it's really important that when you're constructing your tiny home and you're thinking about the design of it, that you also realize this is still a place of, you know, this is still a place that should feel like home and should act as your own little personal sanctuary and still can express a part of who you are through your interiors. Touching on furniture, there's really great furniture manufacturers that make multifunctional furniture pieces. I will include their name here. I think it's called Ex Exchange Extract, I can't remember. But basically they have certain items that will do multiple things. There's one really cool one that um, if it, you have your couch in front and then you can fold it down and there's a bed there. So if you're going for a really tiny footprint where you don't actually have space to say have a bedroom, you can actually fold this down and you can have your bed basically pull out over top of your sofa. And then when you're done sleeping, you just fold it up and it's out of the way. It's a Murphy bed, but like, it's a funky Murphy bed. It's a lot more functional of a Murphy bed. I feel like the old traditional Murphy beds were just like, it just looked like a bed in a wall. <laughs> like you kind of knew what it was. Whereas this particular furniture company makes a lot of pieces that do a lot of multiple things. So you can have a coffee table that lifts up into more of a dining table. You can have a, um, office desk setup that actually folds down into bunk beds or or a bed, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'll include some images of that. And that's a really cool thing to also think about. And what's, what's really smart is when you're working with your designer to create your tiny home is to start thinking about those before the layout's fully finalized so that you can make adjustments before construction to allow for those pieces to actually be built with the intention of housing them within the space. I think another thing that's really important is trying to make sure in a tiny house that you maximize your indoor outdoor space. So in places like Ontario, we, we, you know, experience four seasons. So we have a very cold winter, but I still think it's really important that in those beautiful summer months that you can try to open up a portion of the home to fully embrace the outdoors. It makes your space feel much larger. And even in the colder months, having that nice open view, a lot of windows, a lot of natural light will make the space feel better. It will make it feel bigger. And you'll really enjoy having um, that airiness to the space. I think it really does just help a tiny home feel less tiny. And it's not that you don't mind the tininess. It's just there's something about that um, kind of like false third wall in a way, like having the glass and having 
having the natural light that's really, really important. And there's lots of studies behind that, right? Uh, natural light is really good for our own mental health. So that's something that is really worth, you know, thinking about embracing and spending the extra money on in a tiny house. So windows are very costly, of course. That is one of the things that um, with a tiny house, like you could use standard generic windows, but I would recommend that this is probably an area where you wanna to try to consider some larger scale windows because it is a smaller home. And overall, you're not buying as many as a full size home. So I think it's kind of where you should splurge. And there are things that are worth splurging on, you know, and I would say the windows are definitely one of the, one of them and if you're doing like a bifold door or an exterior some some way to connect the inside to outside that that would be another area that I would say is worth splurging on um, versus skimping on for costs so another area that I want to just do like that little reminder of is storage items again so you got to think of like coats shoes clothing um, cleaning supplies towels all the things that you use in your day-to-day -day life that we almost use without thinking about, you wanna think about in your tiny home where they will live. And that's really, really important because if you design a tiny home with that thought in mind, then the tiny home will function much better for you for as long as you're living in it or if you're renting it out as an you know, for you, for other people, for Airbnb, whatever it is that you're using your tiny house for. It's really, really important to think and start keeping track of all the little things that you use day to day and like where you would put them and where you would store them. Once you have every place that has a home, you'll find that the tiny house in general just function much better. What I think is really cool is the reasons for building a tiny home you know, on your property in perhaps the city where it's allowing it is really exciting because you have an opportunity to supplement your income. Let's say you build a tiny home that you're gonna rent out for, you know, to have tenants. So there's one income stream there. You could look at potentially having an Airbnb. You could perhaps look at, at le leasing or renting out your larger home and you living in the tiny home. There's a lot of really interesting ways that we can look at incorporating tiny homes in uh, the urban area as well as, well, it doesn't matter where you live, to be honest. There's a lot of ways that we can embrace it. And I think it's not the solution to a lot of the housing problems that we're facing, but it's definitely another layer that we can build in to help address it. And I mean, I could go on about all the things that probably should happen from a government level to like, address our housing issues. But from a designer's point of view, I think it's really interesting to see this movement come forward and that we're able to embrace it a lot more, especially here where I'm living. It's finally something that people can actually take on as a project and actually move forward with putting a tiny home that's available for rent on their own property, which is something that was really hard to do before because of some of our, you know, restrictions and bylaws and stuff. So it's really exciting to see that that's changing. So if you're interested in possibly designing and building a tiny home, I will include the link below to our Etsy page that does have, you know, some generic tiny house plans that you can work with your own builder, uh, general contractor, designer to manipulate to your standards, like wherever you live, your building code standards, and use those plans as a starting point. Also, if you are local to the Kitchener-Waterloo area and you're interested in having a tiny home constructed, it is something that we have been taking on quite a bit of more clients on. So definitely, you know, feel free to reach out. I'll include the link below for my website where you can reach out if you're interested in having a tiny home custom designed. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up and check out this video next. YouTube seems to think you'll like it. All right, guys, until next time, bye.